three, two, one. Hey, you amazing earthlings. Welcome to episode six of Shifting the Paradigm. Before we get the show started with today's guest, John Greenwald Jr., I just have a couple of quick announcements. First, I'm going to be running some polls over the next week uh, across my social media concerning other areas of the paranormal and the supernatural. I want you to look out for these polls as I want your participation. I will be announcing a new show soon and the polls will help with the show direction. Second, for those who don't want to use Patreon and prefer a simpler way to support my work on this channel, I opened a single tier channel membership, which is why you see a join button below to the subscribe button right next to it. Click on the join button, check out the list of supporter perks and benefits. I really appreciate you joining the community. Finally, I want to answer a question sent to me by one of my viewers, it being, do you prepare your questions before the show or do you just say them as you go along? And this is a great question. I do research into every guest and try to listen to as many interviews that they have done so I don't repeat the same question already asked elsewhere. Then I look at their social media and forums to see what many people are asking over and over, like questions that many want answered. Then I go through their research, their own blogs and videos to see what they're focused on and formulate questions from that. I want my viewers to come to find the best information here rather than just listen to chat and commentaries so you can depend on me for the tough questions. Yay! Okay, so today I'm joined by John Greenwald Jr., who has been so helpful to, for me and cheerleading me on this channel since I started it. Knowing his story and his dedication to digging from truth from a young age has been especially inspiring to me, and I know it will be, and I know it will be for my younger viewers who are now just getting into the topic in a serious way. John Greenwald Jr began researching UFOs when he was 15 years old and took it to the next level by utilizing the Freedom of Information Act, also known as FOIA, to dig deeply into the US government and its agencies for answers. And those documents he received, he dedicated into putting out for the public on his website, The Black Fault. Today, he has amassed over 2,300,000 pages of declassified records through his pioneering efforts. Guys, that is crazy amount of paperwork. He has appeared on numerous television and radio programs throughout the world and is frequently sourced in various news articles and stories for his archives and his discoveries. Please welcome with me, Mr. John Greenwald Jr. Hi, Christina. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining me here today and taking the time to do it on a Thursday. Just like well, nice. that's that's thanks to you because of my crazy schedule. So I hope everyone knows how accommodating you are to guests. I was the pain in the booty on that one, and you came through for me. So I appreciate that. Hey, look, being being a full time dad, having a full time job is no easy task. It's uh, it's a little bit crazy. Yeah, I wish there was more time in the day. Uh, so I I, I uh, had really appreciated you shifting that for me because I know I, I think you usually do shows on Friday nights, and so I appreciate it. My, it's it's my honor that you're on the show, but enough about all this nice niceness, right? Let's go yeah. straight into Here's the, the question. Spotlight. Here it comes. You said you <laughs> research your guests. I was like, uh oh, here we go. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not good to go in blind, you know. Yeah, no, that's no, that's good. I, I compliment <laughs> you for that. It's always good. You do sometimes you do interviews and you realize the guests probably never really looked at anything that that <sighs> either background or what they were going to ask you. So. It's always enlightening and refreshing to see that a host actually cares about that. Oh, I care about you, John. <laughs> Thanks. That's one person out there. That's good. Yes. 
Okay. So, so my first question I want to jump in right with is aimed mainly for my younger audience, uh, many of whom want to play a part into uncovering the truth of this mystery. Given you started when you were 15 years old, what was it that compelled you to go into such a different direction as to try and tackle the U.S. government to find out its secret information about UFOs? Yeah, it was a weird decision to make based purely on... Uh, curiosity. I really wish I had a much better story for you when it comes to, you know, I, I saw something, I experienced something. I don't have any of that. Uh, not only then and even now, I was struck by a curiosity. Like you said, I started when I was 15. But prior to that, even like 13, 14, uh, America Online was in DOS. I'm aging myself to your, your viewers uh, at that point. But that's where I started on the internet. America Online was for DOS. And you'd go to these chat rooms and you start to see the information that was out there. And I, and I just fell in love with it. I wanted, I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to see more. And uh, through the next year or two, as I researched it, I uh, realized government documents were the coolest thing to me. And at the time, found this this four-page government document. It's infamously known in ufology as the 1976 Iran incident. And I, I thought, there's no way that this is real. And read through it, and I was 15 at the time, and they talked about this thing called the Freedom of Information Act. And I'm like, what, you know, <laughs> what's that? But the key word was, they'll send it to you for free. And that was a way to verify this, this website that had published it. So I was like, free, cool, that's awesome. So I sent off the this thing called a FOIA request. I had no idea what that was. And sure enough, that document came in the mail. And after then, I was hooked. Uh, back in 1996, government agencies didn't have uh, a way to submit electronically. So you had to literally lick stamps, you know, and put them on the letters and send them off. Oh my gosh, and old that's school. Where, yeah, totally old school. And, and that's how they were. And, and, you know, again, I'm aging myself a little bit, but governments actually do, uh, the U S government really does operate very old school. Uh, even today, you know, it's, it, you'd be amazed uh, from a technical side, how, how obsolete a lot of their stuff is. So at that time, again, I was just mailing these things and that one request has now turned into over 10,000 over the last 20. Now it'll be 25 years this year in August since I, since I started. So it, it, it was never what I thought would be a lifelong journey, and yet it has, and, and I don't really see myself stopping anytime soon. Was this a mission you undertook with help from anyone else, like family members, friends, or other UFO researchers? Uh, quite to the contrary. Uh, my family, although later learned about it, I was doing it much of it on my own. Uh, when it came to other researchers, no. I want to give a, a shout out to my friend of more than two decades, the late Stanton Friedman, because the, the, where I point him out is when I was 15 and 16, I wrote all of the main you know, UFO researchers and investigators and all the big names. No one wrote back except one man, and that was Stanton Friedman. And he didn't try and sell me anything. He didn't try and do anything other than send me a big envelope of information that he had amassed. And I was so encouraged by that because it it just kind of lit a fire in me. Wow, this this guy you know believes that I can do something. And he made that comment. He's like, "Here, here's a starting point. You know, uh, essentially, just go for it." And and that's what I did. So I always like to recognize him uh, just simply because he was my motivator. He he again was that only person that that wrote back back in in the the late '90s when I was reaching out to everybody. And it's a testament to who he is as a gentleman, uh, honestly, it, as a person and and as a gentleman and as a researcher. And over the years, we became friends. And uh, again, we were we were uh, essentially friends for for 20 years uh, prior to him uh, passing away. But uh, other than that, I, no, it was all by myself. I mean, I, I've self-funded. I literally would save my pennies and dollars to, to get scanners. I, I would get donations as well, not only financial, but equipment. So people would send in like the, the first thing I got was a scanner in the mail and somebody sent me this old flatbed scanner because I was typing documents in by hand and I, yeah, I couldn't afford a scanner. So I literally would, would hold the piece of paper and then I would, I developed a legend uh, at the time where certain characters would depict certain things that you would see on the page. So if it was a stamped word, I had them in brackets. 
and I still remember all the codes, you know, and, and in, uh, in, in computer text blacked out, you can actually do black boxes. So I would do black boxes and literally try and measure the length and I would reproduce it that way. And I think I went cross-eyed about three or 400 pages in at that point. Uh, you know, now I, I look back in retrospect, I've got, as you pointed out, over 2.3 million pages. That's a heck of a lot uh, different. But at the time I was like, you know, where, where am I going with this? I'm not really sure, but I would just sit there and, and type it in and upload all the documents. And then as the scanner came in and then technology got better, uh, PDFs weren't even popular at that time. So I was scanning them in and then programming every single page one by one. What? And so you would have to click on a link and it would flip the page. So uh, it's amazing to see, and this is the geek in me coming out, but it's amazing to see how the internet has changed in the last 25 years, where now PDFs, I can give you a thousand page PDF and you can download it in eight seconds. You know, back then you got to dial up and you got to click on the image and it takes 40 seconds, you know? So times are different and it's amazing to see that evolution. But here we are 25 years later, the Black Vault, I knock on wood, I hope I've adapted and people like it. Uh, it serves about 18 to 20,000 people a day right now. Um, wow. Yeah, okay. so it, it's uh, every day. Uh, so, and they download, you know, terabytes and terabytes worth of data. So since then, since typing in, now I've had to buy multiple dedicated servers to handle the traffic. And then, you know, it's not uncommon maybe to appear in a, a news article or a couple of them. And then, then, then the traffic really starts, you know, and, and you get a couple hundred thousand people a day. And that's, that's when you see those servers really cooking. So it's, uh, again, that's the geek in me, but it's, it's fun to see that development from the late nineties, uh, from that teenager that was just typing it in to now dropping, you know, tens of thousands of pages at a time. It's been a fun ride for me. And how did you power through those times when maybe at a young age you got to feel overwhelmed or maybe when the doubt crept in uh, with the scope of what you were trying to achieve? You just have to learn patience, especially with the Freedom of Information Act, UFOs, but ultimately everything that you decide to put your mind to and your heart to. And, and again, I'm broadening it from just UFOs because that's what I did when I was uh, younger. It took a long time to get a lot of the UFO information from the US government. And so what I did was I thought, well, okay, I'm fascinated by all these other government secrets. I'll just start hammering them about this, and JFK assassination, and biological weapons. What I did was I kept myself busy so I could remain patient for that other stuff. And then in time, then all of a sudden it would kind of catch up to where, yes, I was working on all these other projects, but then that stuff that I did a year or two years prior was coming in. And then I would post those documents. In the bigger picture, my biggest advice for people is patience. And, and because it can get very frustrating, not only for waiting, not only for the games, but a lot of time just for the information in general. And now I'm kind of honing back in on UFOs, but the information in general because it's sometimes very frustrating to see what does get popular when you feel it shouldn't, or you feel that evidence is being overlooked. Uh, it gets frustrating. You get beat up a lot. If you don't take the company line, you know, social media can be toxic. I know that comes as a shock to many people, but social media can be very tox uh, toxic. And so in turn, you get kind of beat up by that and you get frustrated and you're like, why am I doing this? You know? Uh, so patience is the biggest, the biggest piece of advice that I pass on to people because there's so many levels to it. Uh, but it takes you a long way and, and you can go very, very far if you have that one quality about your research and about what you're doing is just being patient. Dang. Do you have any, do you have any advice on how to be patient? Something <laughs> that you might practice? If you're over 21, drink a lot. Uh, that's it. No. Um, <laughs> joking aside, no, it's, it's, it's not getting too tied up and emotionally invested. And that's very hard in topics such as these, because especially with social media, it can be very toxic, but I'm going to flip what I said and say, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And you can see how people are and why they're in topics such as UFOs. 
And the psychology behind it is, is incredibly fascinating to me because you have a lot of people from a wide spectrum. You have those that are into the nuts and bolts, the engineers, the former aerospace guys. You know, you've got that huge group of people that are into it because of the physical three-dimensional phenomena, whatever it, it may be that they can touch and they want to touch it. But then you have the opposite side of the spectrum. Those that are described maybe more as new age or, you know, someone that that is more into the spiritual aspect of it. That's a little out of my wheelhouse, but that's obviously very, very prevalent in this. So you have this wide array of people that are that are into the topic. And that's where I think that that social media is very powerful, because if you can step back and not get too emotionally invested, you can see how powerful that is. And in turn, that helps you stay a little bit patient because you can share information, but in turn, get information shared back with you and you can learn from them. So if you're over here on the spectrum and then all of a sudden you encounter someone over here, as long as you guys can play nice in the sandbox together, which sometimes is very difficult to do, a lot of times yeah. you can meet in the middle and learn a lot along the way. And, and that's that's one thing that I've always loved. And hey, I'm the first to say, you know, you get caught up in in these, you know, battles and you want to be right and they want to be right. And then you get caught up into it. It's easy to do. We've all done it, but Absolutely. sometimes it's, it's good to take a step back and go, okay, you know, let's, let's look at the information, di dissect it, digest it, and then uh, see what comes tomorrow and, and see and what we can offer, but also what we can receive. And with that kind of patience, it requires a lot of knowledge as well. And let me just tell you, in the chat, people are loving you. Uh, Jazz oh, says, I've you. interviewed John several times. He's a tiger. Oh, good Luis. old Jazz. I love Jazz. <laughs> I love him too. Luis Jimenez is here. Luis is Jimenez's dad is here, UFO dad. I don't know if you've met him, but he, I have he's not, a fireball. But yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, uh, thank you to everybody in the chat. It's very cool to see. Yeah, Brad says he, you are a legend. I oh, mean, thank I mean, you, Brad. In a way, yes, you are like the FOIA king. Let's well, be real. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Also, Amy says he is so cool. Thank you. I love the emojis on that one, too. Very right. cool. <laughs> <laughs> the Black Fault FOIA dumps are legendary. Oh, thank you. Well, you're going to love a, a one coming up in the next couple of weeks, which will stretch literally over 350 to 400,000 pages. So, uh, and that is not an exaggeration. Uh, if you love Air Force history, there is a gigantic amount of information coming. So yeah, stay tuned for that dump. It'll be the biggest one-time dump of information ever that oh, I'm I've done. I'm looking forward to it. Um, do you remember at what age you were when things really started moving for you and the website, that like, aha moment when you knew you were doing exactly what you wanted to do? I think I've always known that I loved what I was doing. You know, and and for me, I didn't get into it to be on the radio or be on television or or do anything to 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 um, essentially increase exposure that way. What I fell in love with from day one, even back when I was serving five people a day, you know, and I'd see the logs and go, "Oh my gosh, twelve people came to my website today," you know, and and I geeked out about that at the time. It was amazing that what what I was was doing at that time was helping other people. And that was actually my motivating factor for creating the Black Vault was when I had received that four page document, that, that 1976 Iran incident document, I didn't immediately start filing FOIA requests. I went back to the internet and started searching around. Google wasn't really even a thing back then. It was Alta Vista for those longtime internet users. And I remember at that time, I was, I was searching everywhere for official government documents because that started to intrigue me the most. And there weren't any. And so my motivation was, okay, if I'm looking for this, other people have to be looking for it as well. And so I created what I was looking for. And that was the model. That was, that was what I uh, modeled the Black Vault after was what I was looking for. And so to see the progression, that was my, that was my number one motivating factor. So I always knew that where I think my family who, uh, Again, in the very, very beginning stages, I don't think realized what I was doing. My dad worked for, for Rocketdyne and he worked for um, uh, 
uh, on the space shuttle uh, for you know and NASA and stuff like that. But Rocketdyne was where it started. It later got sold to Boeing and Pratt and Whitney, and you, you know, hear the corporate takeovers. But at, when I was that young, it was Rocketdyne. I'm actually not officially a junior. Uh, I adopted the junior just to differentiate between my dad and myself because at 15, 16, 17, I was going after essentially highly classified pieces of information. My dad was working for a government contractor, although he says he never had a clearance, which, you know, I still question you, dad, if you're watching, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find out one day. Uh, but he was working on sensitive projects like the space shuttle, even though that's not a classified program. Well, we know that. Uh, but obviously, you can't go around and start sharing the schematics to the, the the engines that they were using and stuff like that. So there was some level of sensitivity to it. Well, he has the same name I do. We're both John Greenwald. So here I am just hammering the government for every classified secret I could get. And, uh, you know, my poor dad realized it. So I adopted the junior and then would put a copy of my student ID into every FOIA request. Mm -hmm. The first television interview I ever did interviewed my father, my mother, my sister, all before they ever, ever even got to me. That was for Whitley Strieber's two hour special based on his book, Confirmation. And Whitley had learned about me through Art Bell and Art gave me my first radio spot, which was awesome because uh, he believed in what I was doing. And that was a gigantic show to be on uh, on, a, on a nightly show. And then Whitley had learned about it, said, can you be on the television show? I went back on Art Bell. We did like a, I, if I remember correctly, it was like a four hour show. When you oh do goodness. four hour shows with Art Bell in radio syndication, your ear bleeds by the end. And I did it with Art uh, quite a few times over the years before he had retired. But at that moment, when the NBC crew came and the Art Bell traffic came and that that kind of exposure, my I think my parents then woke up and said, "He's probably doing something he shouldn't be in that computer room. What's he doing?" You know, and uh, they realized I was hounding the government, and well, they couldn't stop me at that point, so I just kept at it. But that's where I got the junior, and uh, I think that that was their turning point. So I know that you didn't specifically ask about my family, but <laughs> that was the turning point for for them, which I feel. Then in my life, I realized, okay, I was doing something that, you know, probably wasn't normal. I, I, I just thought hammering the government every day for government secrets was normal, but uh, little did I know it's, it's not. Okay, so time to shift gears just a bit. Okay. Let's look at the recent podcast you did with Mick West and Robert Powell on yes. April 24th, which is like, I think about five days ago. Uh, what thoughts did you come away with from that discussion? Yeah, let me preface it by saying I really, I, I truly am on the fence. I said this in my show, but I'll, I'll say it here again. I truly am on the fence. I don't know. I don't have the knowledge or expertise to go, you know what? That is an F-18. That is a conventional jet. That is a UFO. That's a drone or whatever. So I leave it to the experts with that knowledge. I had interviewed Mick West and Robert Powell independently uh, prior, and everybody wanted to see them quote unquote Together. debate. I didn't didn't treat it as a formal debate, but that's that's uh, what people wanted to see. So I had put it out there. I said, look, guys, if you need a venue, I won't take sides because I don't have a side. And that was where that's how I went into it. Coming out, I feel I'm pretty much in the same boat because both gentlemen made excellent points. They can they can they can prove part of their side. I feel part of their side is not proven. Uh, so when you look at that, for me, I, I took that step back and just kind of uh, looked at everything and thought, you know, okay, um, what, you know, what are these guys, what are they, what are these guys really saying? Am I going to come out of this convinced? And when it was all said and done, to be honest with you, I wasn't, uh, and, and either way, either direction, but it was fascinating to watch because again, both sides had these, these angles and, and both of which made excellent points. And that really is ufology in a nutshell. Because generally, you can play devil's advocate in a ufological debate and still make powerful points because no one side is truly so overwhelming uh, on most things. There are some exceptions to that rule. But talking about UFOs in a whole and some of these controversial topics, you know, both sides will make powerful points that are very hard to negate. So yeah. And and what did you conclude about the conflict ideas they had with the Kevin Day when Kevin Day gave each person different information? 
Yeah. What were so your thoughts on that? That's what's tough about witness testimony. And that is an excellent point that Mick West makes. And I fully support him on that. And, and in the show, I, I kind of essentially had, had structured my question to him like that, uh, to just put it in a nutshell saying, okay, you're saying witnesses just aren't reliable. And, and that is true. I mean, over the years, I can tell you uh, that is absolutely true, not only with this, but obviously UFOs as a whole. And just in general, if you take four people out and have them stand on four corners of an intersection and they all watch a car accident, all four of them will essentially have a different story about how it happened, right? We all know that. We see it all the time. People interpret things in very different ways. When you add in an extraordinary case like a UFO thing, obviously people then are going to really have wildly differing points of view. So Mick, although he and I have sparred on, on social media before, we've uh, had respectful disagreements uh, quite a few times, and I don't buy everything that he says. I support him on this one because to him, he is that nuts and bolts. Okay, if you say it, I want to reproduce it. I, I want to prove it either in a video, an experiment, or find an expert that, that will undoubtedly show it. And I respect that. I, I really do. With the skeptics who truly, even though they're skeptics or so-called debunkers, which Mick calls himself, I hate the word, but, but he calls himself a debunker. That's his role. That's fine. Because you know what? He elevates me. Like he makes that standard that I shoot for that much higher. Exactly. And, and it's, it's also so healthy to have both sides of an argument so that when you are researching, it's good to research the, the contrary argument. That's right. To yeah. strengthen your argument. That No, that's, that's right. It, it really helps a lot. So with Mick, I mean, I, I, I know he gets a bad rap from a lot of people and, and some people are very vicious towards him, but you know what? Somebody told me something on Reddit uh, and I, and I wish I remember their username cause I'd give them a shout out, but it was a couple of years ago and, and it was about a controversial aspect to all of this, not, not the Nimitz encounter, but something else. And, and I was getting attacked for it. And, and this person said, you know what? Truth stands up to all forms of scrutiny. So no matter what you ask or do, as long as you're not fabricating and you're not making stuff up as you go, then the truth will prevail no matter what. And that rang true, just a social media comment rang so true to me because I'm like, yeah, why are people so vicious towards other people? I've seen it directed towards me. I've seen it directed towards Mick. I've seen it directed towards uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, by the way, I've worked with as an excellent, awesome person is super intelligent. And, and yeah, so he's not on the up and up on UFOs and sure he's a skeptic, but that doesn't matter. Those people push you that much higher on your bar of, uh, of your standards. And, and because if you hit that bar and keep pushing it forward, no matter what Mick West or Bill Nye or, or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of those skeptics say, no matter what they say, they'll never pull down the truth. And if they can, then that bar isn't set high enough. And I think that that's something that Mick has truly shined with in showing that some of this can be explained, but others are so apprehensive to look at it they are more willing to believe something not based on evidence because they just want to believe it versus Mick actually demonstrating, hey, this is potentially explainable. So again, I don't agree with everything Mick West says because I don't, but he does elevate that standard. And that's what we need in a topic like this. And I'm not afraid of, of people like Mick. And I think that anybody that is speaking the truth shouldn't be either. I agree. I agree with that. I think I think it's healthy to hear both sides of it without having an opinion, but just listening. Yeah. Um, a question now from greg.com, one of my Patreon supporters. He asks, can you share your opinion on the recent pyramid video footage that was released through Jeremy Corbell? Sure. So uh, not to keep uh, bringing up Mick West, but I will on this one. Uh, <laughs> he has some great videos demonstrating that what we are looking at in that video is easily reproducible. 
Uh, and, and again, I won't get into the technical aspect of it cause I don't want to bore your viewers, but, uh, I also don't fully grasp all the technical nature of the inside of the aperture of a night vision camera, right? There's not many people that do, but the point that I want to make is in something like that, when you do look at reproducibility, you have to start questioning, okay, what is this? And when it comes to these leaks in the United States government, I want to know why they've been allowed to happen. And it's not every day when information leaks out. Now you do have these, you know, unnamed sources and various news articles not related to UFOs that are talking about, you know, chatter inside the White House or chatter within the DOD. But it's very rare when you start getting information from classified briefings, right? When that happens, you know what hits the fan. And Edward Snowden <laughs> is a prime example. There are certain things that take place when either classified or sensitive information leaks out. And yet it seems like with the UFO stuff, eh, eh, who, who cares? You know, it seems like no one really cares inside the government. Now we so, do know, sorry, go ahead. So um, are you planning on filing any FOIA requests in regard to the pyramid footage then? Yes, already done. <gasps> yeah. And, when, and, and what's the news? When are you going to get it? Uh, probably 2037. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Hopefully it's, it's, it's early. Uh, but when stuff like this surfaces, I may have my own personal feelings that, oh, okay, it's explainable. That doesn't matter for me. The context of why I was able to get the Pentagon to admit so quick that Friday night. So I think Jeremy's footage of memory serves was that Thursday, George Knapps was, I think Tuesday. So, so first was Tuesday, the, the photos, 48 hours later, I, th I think, don't quote me on the exact timeline, but Jeremy Corbell's video. And so I was hounding the Pentagon for, for statements. And, uh, you know, it was like, okay, more leaks, you know, can you guys comment on this? Never expecting they actually would. They wouldn't give the designation. This is why I'm telling you that, that context a little bit. Although I got them to admit that the, that the videos were not doctored and real and taken by the U.S. Navy, they will not tell you the designation. Now, why is that important? The designation would tell us, does the Navy feel that these are UAPs or UFOs or unidentified? And they wouldn't do that. The question is why? And I think that something that I can't discount at this point is that these could potentially be a, let's say a Rosetta Stone type reference document material that they could look at and go, yeah, the pilot truly thought he was seeing an unknown but this is a radar reflector or a balloon or a drone or, you know, fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. I want to know the context because here's another connection I have to this story is when you go back to 2000, I think it was 19 that the U S Navy, although they never admitted at that time that the FLIR, the gimbal and the go fast were legitimate. I got them to go on the record to say they were unidentified. And that nice. turned into a massive viral story that went worldwide because it was the first time that, that the military had gone on the record about them. But then on top of that said, we don't know what these things are. So we can look at this in two ways. Did they learn their lesson on that one and go, uh, we don't want that type of exposure again. So just don't say anything or do they not want to say they're identified? And, and if that's true, why? So you can look at it at both angles and I don't know what the right answer is, but I am intrigued by the fact that these things just leak out. They're allegedly from a classified briefing presentation. Uh, we don't have confirmation of that, but we do know they're being utilized, but they just leak out and it's like, yeah, yeah, they're real. Cool. It's like, no, that, that no, look at when Edward Snowden was putting out stuff like you guys went into clam mode and didn't want to talk about anything. And, and so again, you, you, um, the reason why I go back to very quickly, the reason why I go back to historical stuff is that's, that's how you can juxtapose what's going on now. Because if I've learned one thing in 25 years with the U S government is that history often repeats itself. And so when you, and, and you can use that as a guide to what are we looking at now? If this was truly sensitive information, what I truly believe would have happened is that you would get no comment whatsoever that they would clam up like they did with the Snowden leaks and then eventually get forced into acknowledging it. But even to this day, a lot of that information that's now been on the, on the internet for, for years from Edward Snowden, the government won't admit to it. They give what's called a Glomar response. We can neither confirm nor deny. 
So when you look at that, a proven history of sensitive and classified information coming out, and for years and years and years, the government will maintain their clam-like appearance of not wanting to come out of their shell and talk about it. But then with UFOs, they're like, yep, that's real within like a day. Yep, no, that's real, taken by the US Navy. How did that happen? And that's what intrigues me more than the identity of the pyramid UFO itself, because that may be explainable. And, and in fact, I think it likely is that specific video. But, but why is all of this happening? And I don't have an answer to that, but that to me is more intriguing than the ID of whatever that pyramid is. Pyramid. I hope that answered his question. <laughs> and I have another question from Grimmorg80, another one of my Patreon supporters. He asks, have you ever received any very compelling evidence that you thought, I wish I could share this? It would complete the truthful narrative. Have I ever received information like like leaked information or behind the scenes stuff? It just says compelling evidence. Well, I am a uh, advocate for transparency. So anything that I do get from the US government, I don't hide, I put it on. When people want to tell me stuff in confidence, um, I gauge it on a case by case. Do I have contacts over 25 years? I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Have they ever given me anything that I go, man, this would just blow it all open, but I can't share it? No, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that. And, and I always, when people want to remain anonymous and they want to share information, I take it with a grain of salt. I am not an advocate for utilizing anonymous sources because this is the internet. You know, I mean, you can do pretty much everything that or anything that you want on the internet and get away with it. So for somebody to, to write me or even call me. I mean, I've got a toll free number that anybody can call. I always take it with a grain of salt. I have no idea, you know, who people are. Will I follow up on leads if it sounds legitimate? Yes. Um, but if, if under my desk, there's a safe with some kind of top secret, uh, debris that I'm not sharing with the world. No, but I wouldn't tell anybody anyway. <laughs> I'm kidding on the last part. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> or pretty convincing to me. <laughs> yes. Twitter will go wild. I confirm or deny that. That's right. <laughs> so I will, I will have, Omar response if anybody tweets at me about that. You, you have been filling and receiving FOIA reports for over two decades. Do you see any patterns emerging with the two million pages that you have been that you have been released? that have been released to you that are inciting enough to give you clues as to what is really going on behind the scenes? Uh, every FOIA release is interesting to me uh, and they will offer clues. You just have to learn how to look for them and, 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 and see what they are. I often describe the FOIA process like a tree. You know, you file a FOIA request and, and, and there's essentially your trunk. And once you get that information, that tree just starts branching off into 12,000 different directions. And, and that's, that's truly, since almost day one, how I've treated what I do, the Freedom of Information Act, and, and how, I, how I operate. So there's always something new, uh, UFOs and not. Especially now with UFOs, this is the exciting aspect to what we're dealing with, even though it's it's speculation on what is this UAP report going to have and what is it going to say and what are people saying behind the scenes. I'm not really sure, but what I can say is things are happening fast. And, and sometimes it's on the skeptical nature where uh, a prime example is I received under FOIA internal communications inside the Air Force. And it revealed that they were essentially saying, all this is about drones. And here the media is yapping on about UFOs and aliens. So it gives, again, now some of your viewers may go, that's a lie. Well, I'm not saying it's true or not, but it's very interesting to see how the mindset is on these uh, topics within these military branches or government agencies. And so then you follow the emails. And so this was a prime example of one that, yes, was one Freedom of Information Act request I got, got a stack of emails, you go through it, you get engaged kind of what they're talking about. But the mm -hmm. key is to look at, 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 at the distribution lists, who's involved in the conversations, what are the topics of the emails, subject lines, and then you file more FOIA requests on some of those other email boxes. 
on some of those other subject lines. And it starts branching out because then you trace back where somebody thought, oh, this is all drones and balloons or whatever, but you start tracing backwards. What are other people saying? What are higher ranking people saying? And so then you get a good idea of what's going on behind the scenes. And those are those branches that just keep going on and on for, for 25 years. Uh, just a quick announcement before we go to the next question. After this live cast is over, uh, after one hour, there's going to be an exclusive um, extra 10 or 15 minutes for the Patreon supporters asking Mr. Greenwald a few extra questions, all exciting ones. So back to the questions. In your latest article, uh, called Harry Reid and his A tip letter, The Mystery Deepens. You mentioned in the second paragraph paragraph that the Department of Defense initially denied that they could find a copy of a specific letter. But after being forced to do a second search after a statement from a Pentagon spokesman, they did produce it, authenticate it, and release it. Is this something that happens often? Uh, you know that they are missing something and you have to push them to do another search? Yeah, one quick correction. They haven't released it yet. So the quick backstory is this was a leaked letter, which even with leaked documents, not a fan of, but uh, George Knapp had put it out there. I had authenticated it with the government, which I was surprised that they did, but they gave me an official statement that it was real. That mm -hmm. started a clock that I had no idea would last more than two years of researching this letter. Because once you establish that it's real in an, an official statement, I know some people hate Pentagon statements. They go, oh, they're not valuable. They're not worth anything. This is a prime example. They are. Because the moment they put it in writing, it becomes legal. And, and, and it's legally citable uh, because it's an official stance. Now, they may take it back one day. They may change it. You may even catch them in a lie. That's irrelevant. As long as it is an official statement, you can cite it. And that's what happened. When I requested the Harry Reid letter, even though we already had it, my intent was also to get the response. Fast forward two years, they said they couldn't find it and they gave what's called a no records response. Mm -hmm. So I immediately said, hey, wait a minute. I have an official statement from the Pentagon that says the letter is real and it was responded to. So I'm going to use that in a appeal. Now, through the FOIA, offices don't like paperwork. They just don't. So I've learned that a lot of times if you make a phone call and just say, look, I, I, before I file the appeal, can I give you this information that may help spark some ideas of where you can find it? And, and most FOIA officers are very helpful. I mean, again, sometimes the end result is not what you're looking for, but they do want to help and they want to avoid all that extra paperwork. So they said, okay, tell you what, don't file the appeal yet. They took the Pentagon statement and fast forward like another month and they miraculously found the letter. But what is still missing is the response. And that was key. Why is it missing? They would not give me a comment. So we are going back to 2009, but what I was able to definitively show was documented proof, all official documents, but documented proof that even as far back as 2009, they were essentially covering up the existence of the letter. They didn't follow protocol with it. They didn't give it what's called an OSD control number. They didn't put it in their control logs. And what those are is every time a U.S. senator or House of Representatives or the president or the vice president writes an agency, it gets a number and it gets put on the, on the log uh, because they have only a certain amount of time to respond. And it's all mandated. And so that with this Harry Reid letter was not done, but I was able to prove that Harry Reid sent two other letters the exact same day protocol was filed, followed by both of them uh, on both of them. And so it showed that whatever was about this a tip letter was something very unique. So you have these things adding up uh, the, again with the log and, and the lack of a control number. But then on top of that, I dug up a CBS news FOIA request that in short should have yielded that letter in, in its response. And I went through like 1900 pages that, that CBS got and it wasn't in there. And my point is, is that whatever it is about this letter, even as far back as 2009, they didn't want the general public to know about it. 
even if it was considered classified, which I don't believe it was, it would appear in the log. And I addressed that too in the article and showed proof of other classified congressional correspondence. So in short, whatever it is about this letter and ATIP, I think the cover-up, for whatever reason the cover-up started, was back in 2009. Do you ever suspect that there is some kind of high-ranking official who's watching every request you file? <laughs> Probably not every re request, but I do know for a fact that 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 many of them will roll their eyes uh, when I, <laughs> you know, uh, submit FOIA requests because there are agencies that I will essentially hit more than others. So, with that being said, you know, it it. Uh, probably irks them a little bit. I have received a uh, notification. This was years ago from somebody in the Pentagon that had uh, written me. They proved who they were. They're long retired, uh, but they had told me about only letters that I knew about in the Pentagon. And he wrote me privately after he retired. And, and he said, uh, you know, he says, I retired because of the bureau bureaucracy and uh, essentially how they treated you with the request that you sent in. And I remember the advice he gave me. And again, this is going back many, many years, but he said, keep at it, kid. And the reason he said that was he said, when, when they would get a letter from you, they would roll their eyes or excuse me, that when they first uh, got the letter from you, they were impressed that a 15 year old kid was utilizing the FOIA. When I didn't give up they would roll their eyes and go, great, it's Greenwald again. And essentially just, you know, throw it onto the desk, on the, onto the pile of what they were getting. And he said that, he said that, that, you know, that's not, that's not what the Freedom of Information Act is. It's to utilize that act to get information. And that was essentially what, what uh, he said, keep at it, kid, because he said, you didn't take the company line, what I call the company line. He says, you didn't take their standard responses. You kept going forward. So that, uh, that advice is, has stuck with me. Oh, this kind of reminds me of um, David Politis when he's always putting all those cases, asking for requests. Just, you remind me of that. Uh, a question from viewer Strife Wilson asks, what are your views on the National Press Club initiative? I guess he means uh, started by Stephen Bassett. Uh, do you think the timing is right to do another one? I think it's always good for advocacy reasons to do stuff like that. Uh, honestly, I, I think that it's good for awareness. It, it sometimes gets press coverage. So I wouldn't say that that it would be a bad idea to do. But at this point, I think we have to wait and see what the government is going to do and how they're going to react with this UAP report and what's actually going to be in it. Because if you do something like that prior, not that you could probably put it together here in the next four or five weeks, but if you were to do something like that, yes, you will get your core audience excited, but essentially you don't have anything to stand on. There's no foundation. That UAP report could potentially be the foundation to then do an event like that and go, see, they are seeing these things. It's potentially a threat. I know people hate the T word, uh, but it is. It's potentially a threat. Uh, we need to look into it. We need to figure out what this is. It needs funding. It needs scientific scrutiny. And we need to figure out all, all of this. So I think that we need to wait uh, to see how the government is going to handle this UFO, uh, this UFO UAP report. But I think it's always good for public awareness and, and knowledge, if done right. Mm. Um, have you ever filed a FOIA request about another researcher in the UFO community? For example, Paul Benowitz. Did I say his name, last name right? Benowitz? Yeah who fell foul of a disinformation campaign. And in that case where the researcher is still, if the researcher is still with us, did you share that document with them? Uh, well, if they're still around, the Privacy Act prohibits me from uh, getting information on any people. So sometimes you can find emails uh, and I've, I've stumbled on journalists' emails and other researchers, nothing earth shattering or anything, but, but that'll sometimes come up. But when you're talking about actual like uh, intelligence files, they have to either give you the permission or you they need to be, you know, passed away at that point. So mm. you can go after those files. And I've got uh, probably into the thousands of pages of UFO researchers and, and investigators from decades past and how the FBI watched a lot of them or they ended up on the FBI watch list uh, for communist ties, communicating with the Soviet Union, uh, being in some of these groups that were trying to 
extract classified information from the government. Uh, there's varying reasons why some of these people ended up within the holdings of the FBI, but they did. And so I go around and I collect them. So I've got a massive archive of all these paranormal related people and their FBI files. Uh, but again, the Privacy Act will prohibit if they are still around, I need to work with them, get their signature and mm. authorization that they can release it. And then of course, go from there. Um, Stan Friedman's actually a prime example. He had a file and and he's obviously one of the more recent ones that has passed away and i dug up his file and discovered that it was mostly what's called a negative name check he had a security clearance so a lot of times military government contractors they will ask the fbi hey can you look in this person uh, in the background of this person let us know if there's any reason you know if they're communicating with soviet union back then or nowadays if you know they're going to iran every eight days and you know going to nefarious groups and meeting with people that are on watch lists obviously you don't want to give them security clearances uh but on the opposite end a lot of times you know that there's nothing they're they fly uh, they pass with flying colors and that was stanton friedman but what was also interesting in addition to that was it took a couple uh times for me to go back and forth with the fbi uh, so first came was the negative name check stuff. A second response actually uncovered that someone, I don't know who, put in Stanton Friedman's name as a potential suspect for the Unabomber. What? Go figure. Yeah. And I, you know, I laughed at that. No, he should not have been on that list. There's speculation on who wrote that letter. I won't say it. He's he's passed long passed away too, but I don't want to speculate too much on who wrote the letter. But yeah, he ended up on this letter and the FBI didn't do anything with it. I mean, Stan was the Unabomber, but I I I laugh about it because anyone who knows Stan knows he wouldn't even be, you know, remotely close to doing something like that. Uh, but further, I think he would have got a kick out of it. That was a document that had never been released before. Uh, and it was something that I had never heard of. I Stan and I had never talked about it. We had talked about other pages from his FBI file, uh, mainly the negative name check stuff, because I know he went after it before he passed away. So I think that he would have gotten a kick out of it. Uh, and I would have loved to have laughed about it with him, but sadly passed away before that ever came to light. But you never know. In short, you never know what you're going to find in some of these files. That's exciting. Like it's that. Fun that adds that curiosity and that fire to be like, Oh, what am I going to get? Like yeah. a little goodie bag, you know? <laughs> yeah, that that's it. And and it is like Christmas. Every time I get a, an envelope in the mail, it's like Christmas opening the thing up, wondering what's going to be inside. That, that's exciting for adults, right? Not for kids. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to ask you about your FOIA investigation into documents related to UFO crash retrievals. I realize that many documents you received um, have redacted sections and can be quite ambiguous. But given all the documents you have received, can you tell me if any of today you feel you have reviewed enough information that makes you believe for sure that there have been UFO crash retrievals, like your mind is made up on it? Well, when it comes to debris and and crash retrieval, I think that the answer is yes, there is supporting evidence to show with official documents, nothing leaked, nothing nefarious that I got it in a dark garage one night when somebody snuck it to me. These are all documents that came from the Freedom of Information Act. Yes, there are documents that talk about debris and wreckage and UFOs. The CIA is one that comes to mind, even post Project Blue Book. I highlighted this document in the last couple of months where there was some kind of physical object. Uh, I don't think they use the word debris, but it was something connected to a UFO case. And they brought it into the CIA scientist. And his recommendation for what these other agents should do with it was blacked out. And so it was really interesting to see because if this was something mundane and explainable. And, you know, after all these years, they could talk about it. It likely wouldn't have been blacked out. I'm still fighting through the Freedom of Information Act to get that unredacted. Uh, but it's a, a fascinating document that shows they had physical objects of something connected to UFOs. Another example came to me through the Department of the Army. And it was very early on when I did this request and got hundreds of pages on uh, my request was about UFOs. The majority of what I got was about 
uh, World War II era Horton brother designs. Uh, from an aviation history aspect, it's fascinating. It's a flying wing design uh, made for the Nazis prior to the B-2 being developed here by Jack Northrop. I mean, it was fascinating material, but not the UFO stuff that I wanted. The reason it came mm -hmm. up was they called it a flying saucer. But when it uh, comes to uh, the debris in about six or eight photographs, there was a flying saucer case from Denmark. They called it a flying saucer case. And in it were multiple pictures of an object that was received from this flying saucer case, but there was no context. Ironically, a case that happened in the 1980s outside of the US government, separated from this incident in, in Denmark in the 40s by decades, a case, UFO case, had a physical object that was received that looked nearly identical. Now, what are the odds of that? I profiled this when I produced for the History Channel twice, actually, uh, because it's fascinating. Because what are the odds? Like if it was a standalone case, it's called the Bob White object. And a lot of people want to explain it as slag and just normal metal from a machine shop. And that's fine. You can reproduce it. So I was talking about reproducibility. You can do that. But what are the odds? that decades and decades prior in the 1940s, a flying saucer case that's archived in US Army files gets declassified and connected to that flying saucer case are all these photographs of an object that looks exactly like the Bob White object. I don't have an explanation for it, but it was a very cool um, synergistic element, I guess you can say, between something that was separated by decades and decades and there's no way that Bob would have known at that time when he got this object that there was a classified file or something within uh, the Army's files that would never be released before that would eventually see the light of day and connect it to a flying saucer case. And, and just figure. to clarify, that document is on the Black Vault website, right? That's correct. Yeah. Profiled that also on the YouTube channel, but also uh, there's articles about it. And I'll, I'll tweet out the links too after the show so, so people can see the, the direct links for those watching. Oh, that's exciting. So we have one more question until we end the day and the podcast. And uh, how often do you file and receive documents that you hold off putting into the black vault for the sake that you're trying to fit several pieces together to show a specific pattern that would clearly indicate a specific narrative, like a journalist who's putting a story together? It's a great question. And it varies. Uh, with the Harry Reid stuff, I can tell you that I waited uh, well over two years. The majority of the story that you read has been written for about a year and a half. Wow. All of that evidence was there and I sat on it because I needed that last element of what was the government going to say. And when they threw the no records response to me and then that battle happened and then that was kind of the catalyst of the story, uh, that, that then had me, uh, uh, that gave me the ability to publish it because now it was complete. But it's hard to sit on evidence for, for two years. Other times, uh, literally, I will open an envelope, go, this is awesome. And that scanner <laughs> right there behind me starts cooking through and scans it, uh, shoots it to the cloud that I operate off of. I program it into the Black Vault, and it's on within you know hours of getting it. So it all, it all varies uh, depending upon the topic and the document. I don't like teasing and I don't like saying, uh, giving stories of what might come because I, again, that's just a setup for a letdown. So with that said, I like to just sit on it as much as I can until when I write it, anybody, any Mick West or Neil deGrasse Tyson who wants to throw heat my way, I can prove every single element of those articles. And with this Harry Reid one, I can. Um, and so for some, it might be a little bit dry because it's a two and a half, you know, two plus year journey to try and uncover this four page document and, and a response to it. So parts of it are, are very dry uh, and it's nothing earth shattering. But my point with using that as the example is that all of what I say is verifiable by anyone with evidence. I, I want to to last the whole day, but we're going to be wrapping up the show here on YouTube. We will keep recording for the Patreon supporters, which will be pasted on the Patreon page later. John, can you tell people where they can find you on social media? 
Sure. Uh, and I appreciate that. The blackvault.com will essentially be your roadmap. Uh, once you go there, that will link to all my social media. I'm active on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you'll see me on Reddit as well and some of the, the, the forums there sharing and, and communicating. Uh, but the blackvault.com will be your best roadmap to finding me online because I'm in quite a few different corners. Wasn't that great? Wasn't he awesome? I loved it. I want to thank my supporters, Dean and Susan Stein, Big Skies, Ali Al, John Doe, Michael Mataluni, and all the other supporters. Thank you so much. And if you are on Patreon, stay tuned to the upcoming questions. But that is it for today. Remember, keep your eyes on the skies and to eat your vegetables. That is it.